What's up, guys? Wanted to do a quick training for you guys, or at least a video, because I thought it was important. And I really wanted to go over why I think real estate is a better investment than all these other asset classes and opportunities out there for investment vehicle as it relates to that. So for you guys that know me for a while, I'm a, I am run Bell Capital. I'm the CEO, founder of Bell Capital. We've done, I've done over $59 million worth of real estate. Bell Capital is an actual fund, just like a hedge fund or a private equity fund, except I'm investing money into real estate, apartments, cash flow, income producing apartments. That's the target for what it is that we do here at this fund. Unlike other fund managers, hedge fund people, private equity, you really don't know where your money's going. But the point of that was there's investment principles. Anytime you're going to invest money into an asset that you're looking to either get some form of a return or have your money multiplied, you got to think through these things. And these are mine. All right. So very first one is always capital Preservation. Yeah, what that says, preservation. Close enough. <laughs> Preserve capital. Do not lose money. That is number one. If you've ever heard Warren Buffett, he always says the rules of investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two to investing, don't forget rule number one. Everyone forgets that. It's not just whether you can make money. Your very first job, whether you're investing your own money or investing anybody else's money or investing with somebody else, you want to hear them say that. My goal is to not lose your money. If you take a look at what's going on out there in the marketplace, in real estate, some of these big syndicators have already stopped distributions to their investors because they either bought at the wrong time in the cycle and or they've had to foreclose and they've given their properties back because they didn't uh, underwrite the way that I underwrite for worst case scenario, break even, um, knowing where your debt is going to sit. What is the worst thing that could happen to you? Did that property survive? All these other things that I pay attention to because- I'm already thinking, man, I don't want to lose money. I don't want to lose my investor's money. That's number one, when I'm thinking through something. Number two, the deal has to cash flow. It has to cash flow. It has to come from somewhere, positive cash flow. So it needs to pay its expenses. It needs to pay the debt. It needs to pay my investors. And it needs to pay Victor. So like when you're thinking through these things, it still needs to make financial sense when you're investing any money, your money, somebody else's, or you're investing with someone like me. So I think through that, right? Next it needs to have some form of appreciation. At some point in the future, this thing needs to go up in value. Long-term appreciation. So when you guys think about housing or houses, you go, oh, houses go up. They don't. They go up and down. But when you're thinking through apartment buildings, right, cash flow apartment building, like yeah. quality level apartment buildings. Um, on your hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Hold on one second. Um, you're supporting, supporting us. And in this area. When you're going through business level um, apartment buildings, we're thinking about long-term appreciation, all right? Um, so those are the things that I look at every time I'm doing something. There's never a time that I'm not thinking through whether this property is going to appreciate it at some point through the revenue, through the income. That's always priority for me. And last but not least, well, this isn't the last one, but I want to make sure we have tax benefits. And I'm recording this too, that is so that way you know. So thanks for getting on. So the tax benefits, I'm thinking, okay, is the asset that we're going to be putting our money into going to give us some form of tax benefits? Real estate as a as an income producing thing from a business perspective has some of the best tax benefits, whether it's 1031, you got tax deferred, tax, tax um write-offs, you get depreciation over the property, you got accelerated depreciation which at this moment next year, at the end of this year, coming up at December 31st, January 1, the bonus depreciation that you get to accelerate that is going from 80% to 60%. But I think personally, they're going to bring it back. We're in election year and the president's going to have to do something nice for all these big money people out there. And real estate is one of the easiest places to do that. That 100% bonus depreciation so you can write off, I think that's going to come back. But for now, we can write that off. So if you that's a way for you to actually make money on passive income. And then because you're invested in a good deal and they pass that benefit on to you, you may not have to pay money on the money that you actually make. It can show as a loss for this year and you just kick that can down the road. So that's another thing. Um, and the other thing that we look for is leverage. If we can get good leverage, which means every one dollar buys us three dollars in real estate. In apartment buildings, we're not talking about single family houses, things like that. That does happen sometimes. But on the average, if $1 can buy three, so if you had a million dollars, you can buy a $3 million property because you can get good leverage on these properties 
if they're cash flowing, if they're in a great location, depending on the market and the debt um, and the debt market for financing, which is a little strain right now. So, so, you know, that it's, I was going over a couple of things because I'm recording this and I wanted to have this for future is these are some of the priorities I look at when we're looking at any deals for the fund right now. So capital preservation, it has to cash flow um, to myself, to the investors, pay the debt, pay the expenses, all that stuff. So those positive cash flow, it can't be a negative cash flow deal or have no income coming in. Um, future appreciation, meaning that we can eventually raise um, the rent and that raises the value. In apartment buildings and commercial assets, that's how it goes. It's not like residential where your neighbor's properties go up so yours go up. You can't control that. But you can force appreciation or get long-term appreciation holding these properties long-term with the rents, the rental income. You get the tax benefits. Those are things that we focus on. Can we get tax benefits if we invest money into this asset class and then leverage? Those are the things that we focus on as I'm taking a look at anything. Can we get good leverage? Does a bank want to lend on it? If a bank doesn't want to lend on it as our partner, then we don't want that deal either. So um, that's why I was going over this. And the reason why I wanted to go over this is because a few people had asked. They were like, well, hey, what about... Um, and I won't be long on this because I we're kind of running down a little bit. Thanks for getting on. I appreciate it. Um, but there will be a recording of it. No problem. Good, good, good. Um, and if you have questions, just let me know. So the bigger picture of that was I wanted to kind of because a couple of people had asked me, they're like, okay, so there's these other ones. This is why I think what we're doing is better. So we have houses, we have stocks, we have retirement accounts. Right, retirement. Uh, let's see, what else? We have uh, crypto and gold, right? And whatever else. I mean, stocks, it'll come under bonds, ETC, right? So if you take a look at what I was talking about earlier, which are the things that I'm looking for when I'm thinking about an investment opportunity. Number one, a house. <laughs> you know, and you just weigh that up against these pieces. You go back and forth like a flip chart and go, hey, do you get capital preservation in a house? To me, no. At some point, my neighbor could sell that property for less than what I bought it for. I think I have a bunch of money sitting in this house as it relates to equity. And all of a sudden, it goes away. The whole neighborhood crashes. Everyone wants to move out. Worse, somebody owns their property free and clear. We just had this happen. Sharon was talking to me about this. And those people are able to sell their houses for less, even though they live next door, than the property that is on the market. And all of a sudden, the values start to come down, which is happening. Or interest rates go up and people can afford less monthly payment. So they start offering less on their purchase price. Their buying power goes down. Inflation, all those things happen. So as it relates to a house, does it have capital preservation? No, it does not. It doesn't offer me that. I don't feel good about it. Um, cash flow, it could. But would you rather have one house with one tenant paying? Or would you rather have one address that has 100 units there, 100 people paying every month, just like a business. So when I think through that, I'd rather have the cash flow of something bigger. So it doesn't make me feel great to be like, cool, I have a house, I'm going to rent it out and hope that that works. So from a cash flow perspective, it doesn't check my box. Number three, appreciation. Eh, houses go up, but rents go up faster. So when I think through the apartment buildings, if rent goes up on an apartment building, let's say And I'm getting through this piece. I want to share this with you. So let's just say we have an apartment building that we raise the rent 100 bucks times 100 units. That's $20,000 more in income a month times 12 months. That's $240,000 increase in just income just by raising the rents on that, that dollar figure, right? 100 bucks. So that said, now if we take that divided by a five cap we would have increased the value of that apartment building by $4.8 million. We can't do that with a house. You could just rent it out, but the value of your house, the appreciation of that house has nothing to do with the income of the property, right? So the way that that happens in apartment buildings is the way that I showed you. If you increase the rents, it also increases the value. So you get the appreciation lift based on its revenue because that's how commercial property and apartment buildings at a commercial level or business level is calculated as it relates to valuation. So you automatically get this appreciation piece that goes with that. Tax benefits. Yes, you can get tax benefits from a house. You can do your write-offs. You can do mortgage um, payments, the interest payments. You can have all those things, but it's at such a small level. So it does have that if we're comparing it to a house. And last but not least, leverage. No, <laughs> you don't get great leverage on a house. We're talking about a home you live in. We're not talking about a home you rent out. 
house you live in, yes, you get good leverage because you live there. You don't have to pay anything for it. But let me explain something to you about leverage. Let's say your interest rate on your house is 6%, right? 6%. And let's say you live in that house times six, uh, 10 years. You'd have to, when you sell, you'd have to get a, you'd have to make 60% because you paid out 6% per year times 10. That's 60 years. Uh, or that's six, 10 years. That's 60%. You got to sell over and above. That's not including taxes. So let's say your taxes are 2% per year. That's another 20%, right? For tax purposes and insurance is going up every year. So let's say your insurance went up because you got to pay your insurance. Let's say your insurance is another 1% that it keeps climbing slowly but surely. So at some point you start realizing like, man, maybe this isn't for like people who said my house, the one I live in is a great investment. If you weigh it up against these things, maybe not, especially from a leverage perspective, because when you sell, sometimes you got to almost sell for 70% over what the valuation of your property was. If you're thinking about it as an investment, nothing wrong with owning a house or buying a house, but let's be clear on what that is. It's not, it's not the same thing as an actual investment. So, oh, and I'll run through, I won't go through each one of these, but you get the point. If it was stock, same thing. Capital preservation. Nope. Stock market goes up and down. As a matter of fact, I was watching CNB, CNBC yesterday, and they were talking about how these certain, the certain stocks are going down. Um, I think Macy's was getting this big $6 billion buyout, and all of a sudden their stocks took a dive. Like, so if somebody was invested in a blue chip stock, or let's say Macy's, or you have an investment or your IRA account, and its money is put into all these different S&P 500, which is just basically in the indexes. Those indexes, whenever their ratings on these companies come down, they take those off. So you don't know whether you're making or losing money or not. You're just kind of going along for the ride. So as it relates to stocks and bonds and all that stuff, no, capital preservation, not. Bonds, yes, but you also don't get any cash flow. You don't get appreciation. You don't get the tax benefits. As a matter of fact, if you make 4.5% on a bond, 4% on a bond, let's say you're making 4%. Your bond, your, your, your dividend that you get off that bond when you cash it out, you're going to have to pay that as ordinary income. So you're really only getting about 2%, not 4%, all right? So that doesn't have, and you can't leverage those things as it relates to stocks are concerned. Nobody, oh, you can't even go to Bank of America and say, give me a loan so I can buy Bank of America shares. They'll be like, we don't, we don't do that, right? So if they won't give you a loan to buy their stocks, that means something. <laughs> so what was the other one? Retirement accounts. Retirement accounts, yes, they do preserve your money, but you make money off your retirement account by putting it there in hopes that when you retire and you draw off of it, which when you draw off of it, you'll draw off less, yes, but you are still going to be paying ordinary income or you know uh, taxed at an ordinary income level. So if you're taxed right. at 40%, you're still going to pay 40% on your draws, even though it's less it's still not enough. And that's just being realistic. It's not getting this big hammer that most people think it is. Um, and that's tough. The tax benefits for your IRAs, you already either pay it going in or pay it coming out. So if you say, fine, I'm going to put into my, my IRA, but I'm going to pay the taxes first. So I don't have to pay them later. Great. Then you don't have to pay the taxes later, but your money's building off of less. And if you say, fine, I'll pay them later. And you put this big hunk and you keep doubling down. When you pull out, Uncle Sam wants that money. So you're not getting the tax benefits of it. And you're going to need less later because it can't keep up with inflation unless you're in a great vehicle. And most of the time, people don't even know what their money's in. And last but not least, leverage. You cannot, you, lately, they've been having certain things where you can borrow against your IRA. But then if you borrow against it and you go into one of these other vehicles, because you're probably only going to do that, you know, a house, stocks, bonds, you know, more retirement, crypto, gold, it isn't going to work. Crypto and gold, crypto, yes, you can put your money in crypto. But the reality of it is, is if you take your, you watch the swings of crypto, do you want to bet your do you want to bet any investment on that? Right? As opposed to an apartment building in real estate. For example, would you rather have your money? And this is just a question. You don't have to answer it. <laughs> Where's it at? Sorry, wrong screen. No, I'll answer it. I'd I'd rather make ongoing money than be tied up with um sleepless nights <laughs> wondering yeah. what's going to happen to my money right and if your money was in a property like this you can see it there's a pool there's an address a bunch of units you know what's happening as opposed to the loss of ambiguities like where's my money oh it's in an index growth fund and then you find out later it's in like funding wars halfway across the continent and you're like i don't even believe in this stuff 
But yeah. it's important. I bring that up because a lot of, as of late, a couple of people ask me like, why do you think this is so important? I'm like, dude, you have to believe in your product. You have to believe in real estate. Got to believe in the rents. Now, um, the stuff that we're looking at, the bigger things, they make more sense to do. When I weigh them up against people's options, you know, like we had a guy that was like, oh, um, I'm getting like 4% on my money, which is where that conversation came from. And I was like, hey, you know what? you make a good bit of money. You're in what? 40%, 50% tax bracket. He's like, yeah, probably so because of my business, I try to write everything off and blah, blah, blah. I think so that money that you think you're getting for, you're probably getting two. So if you were to invest in any vehicle, let's say we give you five and you get the tax write off and very investing with someone like me, you would have to really make nine or 10 in the vehicle you're already in because you're really getting two, right? For you to even get five without paying the taxes, because that's what will happen. You get that. And he was like, yeah, I didn't think about it. So like, it's important for someone to share it because very few people talk about this stuff. You know, I'm learning that because I'm like, yeah, I say it. I talk about this all the time. And then people are like, man, I never heard anybody say it the way you did or make it simple or give me an example. Um, and I'll, they're like, or when they do, it's like, you know, it's some pie in the sky and it's meant to be confusing. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be confused in my investments either. I look at deals all day and I do everything to make them simple. So my goal is just to kind of, hey, if somebody's out there, it's not to make people do it with me. I'm just like, let's just get educated on it. Let's make sure that we have the same information to say, these are the things that I find important when I'm looking at any investment. When I'm looking at an apartment building, I'm like, you know, me and Brashana were driving the other day and we were looking at these properties. And um, I told her, I was like, hey, she was like, I like this property. And I was like, you know what? I don't. As a matter of fact, I looked at this property last year. And from the properties that I've looked at since this time, I did like that property. I do not like that property now. I probably wouldn't look at it. Mm -hmm. And she was questioning and I was, at, and I was like, she was like, yeah, but it's still good. And I was like, okay, would you take your grandmother's last dollar and throw it in that deal and have confidence in it? And she was like, no. And I was like, there you go. It's a hard no. You have to do a hard pass. Like, <laughs> like that's what this means. Like, do we love the deal enough that we know we won't lose a dime? And I would take our last dime, Thaddeus's last dime, Brashana's last dime, my mama, dad, my sister, my kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have to know 100% that I believe in it, that we won't lose our money. Then these matter, which is what I was saying before you got on. This is always first. You need to hear people talk about don't lose money. It's great. Everyone likes to brag. They can make you money. But first off, because I got a buddy of mine just lost a bunch of investors money. Now, it wasn't his fault. It was the market. And he's in a market that when everyone says, why don't you look at this market? I was like, I don't like that market. That market has huge swings. I've watched that market happen for a long time. It seems like a lot of great opportunities, but when the getting's good, it's good. And when the getting's bad, it's bad. And sure enough, he's had to give one of these big properties back and everybody was upset with him. Again, not his fault, but from an outsider looking in, that was the big picture. Hey, Capital preservation, don't lose money. Has anyone lost money in this market? Yeah, all over the world. But I've watched more big players lose money in that market before I ever thought about being a big player. I watched the world sink there. And he's had to get on those phone calls and have those conversations. I watch an interview with him and I know him personally and it sucks. I, I wish him the best. He has more properties, you know, so he lost a 300 unit apartment building, but he has like 4,000 units. But this one, taxes went up in that city insurance went from $700 a door to $1,600 a door. And he had to go throw more money down. And it was between going back to his investors, doing another capital call, and raising more money or letting this deal go because the lender wouldn't work with them anymore. And they dragged their heels forever because the rates are triple. His rate was three. Now it's seven and eight and seven and eight make the cap rates go up and it makes your valuation comes down and he couldn't refinance it. He needed time. So like, that's why a lot of people are like, Oh, what are you doing? I'm like, dude, I'm being very persistent, but I'm also being very patient. I look at great deals. I chase them down. We're sticking to having conversation with investors and still raising money. And any deal that I like, I'm dog earing it. We're watching it. We're talking to the owners and brokers, but I'm watching what's happening. We're paying attention to the market itself, not the real estate market, but the capital market. <laughs> what's going on? If we get a great deal, I'll pounce on it. But it has to be the right deal. Why? I don't lose money. We got to get cash flow. We need to make sure our values are going to continue to go up based on we can still raise rents over the seven-year, 10-year time period. We get the tax benefits, which I was saying earlier, the tax benefits of the 80% appreciation, all that stuff, slowly, slowly trickling down. And now the 60%, we still get tax, we still get depreciation. 
But the bonus depreciation that everybody was running towards 100%, you know, uh, bonus depreciation, you write off everything, that's slowly trickling down uh, per year. And then the leverage right now, the leverage is a problem on the, across the United States for the debt market uh, as it relates to these bigger deals. So um, that was really what today was about. I wanted to kind of get, it was just a quick update about what's going on in the market. And I can tell you, this is counterintuitive. Whenever the market's doing bad, the deals that are the deals people are going after are higher quality properties. I've been saying that for a while. I'm sure you probably heard me say it. That is, it's like when, the, when there's blood in the streets, you got to go to higher ground, right? right? You still buy something, but you go to higher ground. What is higher ground in real estate? Better quality assets. You get A-class properties, A-plus, I mean, a B-plus properties in the best locations you can. You don't look at the lesser properties. So right now you got people that, well, you know, I'm one of them too. They're called trophy hunters. If you're a trophy hunter, you're looking for the, you're looking for a boardwalk and park place right now. And you'll wait till you get it. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the play. Um, because if you get one of those now, you won't lose. Cause like, man, that guy took down and took down a, a trophy. And then when the market swings back and everybody rushes in, they're going to have to go back to the C-class properties, but the C-class property, that's going to be the next bell of the ball. Cause nobody knows where the market's going to stop. Um, but it'll start with the C-class apartment buildings, but they're going to be bigger this time. It'll be the bigger ones. And it won't be the small ones that are going to trade. So, um, but that's what I'm seeing out there. This is my kind of like market update and why we do what we do. Um, but primarily it's, that's been it. We looked at a lot of deals um, on the premise and you may have seen this already, but for example, where is it? Uh, This one, no. Like this list right here we have, because we're targeting a lot of owners that their debt is coming due, coming up here within 24, 25. So there's a lot of debt coming due in 24, 25 on all these apartment buildings, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And some of these properties are pretty much newer. Like this is what we did. This is the shift that people don't get that I continue to focus on year built. Hey, if it's in 2019, 2018, 2014, 17, um, I'm sorry, year built right here. Um, some of these newer properties that, you know, like for me, 2012 build is probably going to be the targets that we're going after for some of our stuff. And we're looking at the timeline that they're, that these people have to get out of these deals. They're not struggling, but it's not going to be the seller that wants to sell. It's going to be their equity partner, like the endowment funds, the CalPERS, they're going to be like, hey, you know what? We need to go ahead and we need to pull out the, the equity that we've already put in with you guys as partners. That's who we're going to be dealing with. And I got the broker relationships now to set those up. But now it's chasing down the deals and looking and making sure that we know what we are looking at. Um, and that's huge. Like this is this huge preparement time that a lot of people don't get. If at least some of my buddies that I talk to, they're not they're not thinking like that. They're like, oh, man, we got to get this little deal. And they're getting them. And I'm like, man. I could be looking at these little deals, but like, I, I got to stay firm because what we're going to be doing over the next decade is going to be getting everyday investors to go into the fund. And we're going to get these bigger, nicer properties at these locations and they'll be owned by everyday people. They don't need to be owned by Goldman, JP Morgan, you know, um, CalPERS, all these other bigger firms that are partners that come in for the equity. I want to do something different because there's no one else. There's no one on these lists. Mm hmm there's no one on these lists that are going out that are doing what I'm doing right now. Like if you look at Irvine company, um, Goldrich, they're pretty big. Hanko and company, they're not talking to retail investors. Berkeley House, none of these guys. As a matter of fact, even um, even on this one, RV management, they don't do right retail investors, property west, true America West. All their partners are like CalPERS, all the all the big pension fund pension funders. Like all mm -hmm. these like these groups, they're not going, they're not going online and saying, hey, they're definitely not doing a Zoom at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you aren't gonna For get your sure. heart on a Zoom or you know, Barry Sternlich from Starwood Capital, they got a hundred and something thousand units. He won't get on and say, hey guys, let's do this. All their people are Goldman Sachs people, JP Morgan Chase, New York Life. That's their investors. They're on the other side of the track. I want to do this with regular people and I want to do it long-term. People like myself and you who are like, look, we're just regular people, man, trying to make ends meet so we can play this game and I'm trying to buy the same properties they buy. 
we can actually win. We can actually win this game. 